Welcome to MHM Podcast Network on MovieHouseMemories.com. Podcast for pod people. Our feature presentation begins now. to another episode of Movie House Memories, the podcast where we look back and review the films that we think are the most important films in cinema history. I'm Patrick, and with me are three people who spend a large portion of their lives in darkened movie theaters. First, he's our resident lumberjack and the man who sees symbolism in his cornflakes and is at, the, at this moment sweating his balls off. He's one of the co-hosts of the Criterion Critics and Lunchtime Movie Review Podcast here on the MHN Podcast Network, Bobby Taylor. And Patrick, you chose this movie, and you chose wisely. <laughs> also with us, uh, she's one of the co-hosts of both the Sunday Seconds with the Duke, as well as Golden Age of the Silver Screen podcast here on the MHN Podcast Network, the sole female voice of the show, and my podcast better half, Lori Flores. I hate snakes and spiders. There's no, <laughs> there's no spiders in this one. There's webs. There's webs. Oh, I'm getting confused because I started watching the young Indiana Jones. Ah, there you go. <laughs> Finally, the man who's always willing to get up early in the morning to do a podcast with his American brothers and sisters. He appears regu regularly on the Movie House Concessions, the Number Two Review, and Criterion Critics podcast here on the MHN Podcast Network. You can follow him on Twitter at movie underscore analyst Shane Adam Bassett. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and I'm looking forward to hearing a lot, lot more about uh, Patrick's love affair with Harrison Ford. <laughs> well, you have to come back for every single one of those episodes. <laughs> all right. Well, welcome, everyone. And before we get started, we'd like to thank all the returning listeners to the show and welcome all new listeners to Movie House Memories. Thanks for downloading us and giving us a try. We appreciate your time and attention and hope you keep on listening and following us on Pinterest or Twitter at MH Memories. On either one of those social media outlets, you can keep informed about our occasional written film reviews and film summaries, news on upcoming theatrical releases and trailers, and information on many upcoming podcasts on the MHN Podcast <laughs> Network. Additionally, you can now subscribe to our account on YouTube, where we're now releasing our episodes exclusively. Uh, once there, if you subscribe to our account, you can get updates as to our uh, new releases or when we post new material. You can give us a like or a dislike. And you can also leave a comment about either the films we're reviewing, our opinions on those films, or even suggestions for films that you think should be in the top 100 films of all time. You can also visit our website and give us a little feedback there. Uh, if you go to moviehousememories.com, you can leave comments about our individual episodes or the films we're reviewing. Uh, you can also give a star review. You can also give us a star That's review good. rating as to each of the films we review, so that we can get a consensus rating from the MHM Podcast Network community. As always, we love to hear positive feedback, but we appreciate anything anyone has to say about any of our little shows. Now, with the horrible business out of the way, let's get on to my next pick for one of the greatest films of all time and my continuing love affair of Harrison Ford, as Shane likes to say, uh, 1989's Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. And I have a summary. Can you tell me a story? The film begins in 1912 with a 13-year-old Indiana Jones, played by River Phoenix, on a cave exploring expedition with his Boy Scout troop in the Arches National Park in Utah. While scouting the caves, Indy comes across a group of treasure seekers who have found the Cross of Coronado, a golden crucifix. The looters plan to turn it into their employer, but Indy steals the cross with the intent to donate it to a museum. The looters and their remarkably familiar leader give chase to the young boy and pursue him across the desert and onto a circus train. During the chase across the train, Indy receives a scar upon his chin when he uses a bullwhip for the first time and develops his fear of snakes after he falls into a reptile enclosure. Ultimately, Indy gets away from the thieves and returns to his home to tell his father what happened. After his father shows disinterest in the affair, 
The town's sheriff arrives and takes possession of the cross. The sheriff is on the take, so he turns the cross over to the greedy employer in a white suit. The leader of the looters tells Indy that he lost this one, but he doesn't have to like it before giving Indy his fedora hat. The film then jump cuts to 1938. Indy is once again trying to acquire the cross of Coronado from the white-suited employer who took it from him when he was a child. They are on a boat in a stormy sea. White suit tells his men to throw Indy overboard into the ocean. Indy breaks free from the goons and grabs the cross from white suit. Indy climbs up onto a pile of cargo and swings himself into the ocean right before the ship explodes. Indy returns to Marshall College and turns the cross over to his friend and curator of the college's museum, Marcus Brody. While walking across campus, Indy is kidnapped and taken to see Walter Donovan, a wealthy patron of the museum. Donovan is seeking Indy's assistance in locating the Holy Grail, the cup that caught the blood of Jesus Christ during the crucifixion. Donovan tells Indy that he discovered a partial map to the Grail's location, but his team leader has disappeared while attempting to find the second half of the map. When Indy initially declines his offer, Donovan re reveals that Indy's estranged father, Dr. H Dr. Henry Jones Sr., is the missing team leader. Having reconsidered, Indy and Marcus leave for Venice, Italy to find the Elder Jones. Once in Italy, they meet Henry's colleague, Dr. Elsa Schneider. Elsa shows Indy the library where his father disappeared. Once inside, Indy, figure, Indy figures out that his father was looking for an entrance to hidden catacombs where the last piece of the map was placed. Indy does this by using his father's grail diary, which his father sent to him shortly before his disappearance. Once inside the catacombs, Elsa and Indy find the second marker on the shield of an ancient knight of the fir First Crusade who went looking for the grail centuries before. However, a secret organization called the Brotherhood of the Cruciform Sword sets fire to the petroleum that the catacombs are filled with, and Elsa and Indy barely escape with a rubbing of the shield. The Brotherhood pursue the couple through the streets and waterways of Venice. Indy subdues the men, whose leader, Kazim, reveals that each member of the Brotherhood have sworn to protect the Grail. When Indy tells them that he came looking for his father, not the Grail, Kazim tells Indy that his father is being held in a castle in Austria. Once back at the hotel, Indy gives Marcus a map from his father's diary and sends him to Skendrum to begin the search for the Grail, while he keeps the remainder of the diary and heads north with Elsa to find his father. After arriving at the castle in Austria, Indy discovers that his father has been kidnapped by Nazis. Once he finds his father in the castle... Henry explains to his son that the Nazis wanted him for his grail diary, and that is why he sent it to Indy, to get it away from him. Not realizing his intent, Indy has inadvertently brought the diary back to his father, and moments later, the Nazis take it from the younger Jones. It is revealed that Donovan is working with the Nazis to secure the grail for Adolf Hitler. Even worse, Elsa is also working with the Nazis. The Jones are tied up in an elaborate dining room, which Henry accidentally sets fire to while trying to free himself from his bonds. The Joneses free themselves from their ropes and escape the castle. They are pursued by the Nazis across Austria, but they make it to Hati. Once there, they are told by Indy's friend Sala that Marcus was abducted by the Nazis shortly after arriving in Iskenderun. With the Nazis in possession of the map, Indy must pursue them across the desert in a race to reach the Grail first. Indy, Henry, and Sala find the Nazi expedition and attempt to free Marcus from his captors. However, Henry is captured himself, and Indy is forced to fight the Nazis and their tank on horseback. During the battle, Kazim reappears with the Brotherhood and tries to stop the Nazi from reaching the Grail, but the well-supplied German soldiers make short work of the Brotherhood. Indy frees Marcus and Henry from the tank, but when the tank goes over a cliff, everyone believe, believes that Indy has perished. When Indy reappears after, after having jumped to safety, Henry embraces his son like he has never done before. With the quest not complete, Indy, Henry, Sala, and Marcus follow the Nazis into the Canyon of the Crescent Moon, where an ancient temple is hidden that allegedly contains the Holy Grail. They find the Germans perplexed by a series of booby traps that continues to wipe out the German foot soldiers, preventing them from getting to the Grail. Once Indy's group is discovered, Donovan orders Indy to retrieve the grail for him. To give Indy proper incentive, Donovan shoots Henry in the stomach. Donovan tells Indy the only way to save his father is to use the healing power of the grail. 
using the information in his father's diary, and he makes it past the booby traps due largely to his rediscovered faith in his father. Once in the chamber with the Grail, Indy discovers an ancient knight of the First Crusade. The knight tells Indy that he must choose the Grail from a series of chalices in the room, but he warns the archaeologist that if he chooses the wrong cup, it will kill him. Donovan appears and chooses a chalice that Elsa picks for him. Having chosen the wrong cup, Donovan ages at an accelerated rate and dies. Indy makes his choice of a simple plain cup and drinks from it. The knight tells him that he has chosen wisely, but warns Indy that the power of the grail only works within the temple and that they should not try to remove the grail from the temple's boundaries. Indy takes the grail to his father and heals him with its mysterious powers. Elsa disregards the knight's warning and tries to take the grail with her. Once she crosses the great seal, the temple begins to collapse around them. When the grail falls into a chasm in the floor, Elsa tries to retrieve it while Indy is barely able to hang onto her hand. Unwilling to take her eyes off the prize, Elsa falls into the chasm to her death. The temple continues to collapse, and Indy is hanging on for his life as his father barely has a hold of him. Indy tries to reach the grail himself, and Henry, finally recognizing what is important to him, tells his son to let it go. Indy finally listens and gives his father his other hand so that he can be pulled to safety. Indy's group runs out of the temple just as the entrance collapses. Once outside, Indy and Henry finally are able to communicate with each other and find a newfound mutual respect. Henry reveals that Indy's actual name is Henry Jones Jr. and that the family dog was named Indiana. The film ends with the foursome riding off into the sunset for new adventures. And that is Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. All right. Uh, films are influenced by the times they're made in, and we're lo we look back at some of the big news events, and Lori Flores has her work cut out for her since just last month we did another film from 1989, so she has to come up with new news events. Lori? As Patrick said, the year was 1989. The 61st Academy Awards were held without a host. Some things never change. <laughs> Rain Man won Best Picture and Director. A jury found Oliver North guilty of three charges relating to the Iran-Contra affair. President George H. W. Bush vetoed a minimum wage bill passed by Congress that would have increased the minimum wage to $4.55 an hour. In Texas versus Johnson, the Supreme Court ruled that burning the American flag was protected speech under the First Amendment. The television show Seinfeld premiered and the Berlin Wall was torn down. Films released in 1989 included Driving Miss Daisy, The Little Mermaid, Batman, Parenthood, The War of the Roses, Say Anything, Christmas Vacation, which we just reviewed, and Patrick's pick, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. And that was 1989. All right. We usually start by talking about the casting in the film, and uh, we'll start with Bobby uh, talking about the lead, uh, Harrison Ford playing Henry Indiana Jones Jr. Uh, what did you think of Harrison Ford in this film, Bobby? He was total rubbish. Okay. I figured I, as much. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they could have had anybody play Indiana Jones in the third uh, the third movie. Tom goodness, Selleck. So. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm with Shane on that one. Um, no, he's perfect. I mean, there, there's never been a better Indiana Jones, and he just – he carried it forward. And what I did like about this one that the second one I, I think kind of lost its way a little bit. The first one was phenomenal, but the, the second one kind of lost its way. It became a little more comic-y um, and not real. This one here brought it back, and he was the reason I, – I, obviously, we have additional people that we'll talk about here in a second too, but Harrison Ford – he was playing older, which I loved. They, they didn't keep him at the same Raiders of the Lost Ark age. He was able to age naturally. And even though we were still dealing with Nazis, it was a, a good span. But he 
he was great. I mean, he, he did most of his own stunts. Uh, he looked like he was rugged and, and, uh, and beat up. And I just I enjoyed the camaraderie between he and Sean Connery, which we'll get to in a minute. But he's he's perfect. Absolutely perfect. He's Harrison Ford. What else do I need to say? I've never seen him do something that I didn't like. So and he he is Indiana Jones. I can't imagine anybody else playing him. And he is perfection as Indiana Jones. Every nuance, every line, every sigh, he's he's Indiana Jones. Yeah, exactly what Laurie just said. He's he's Harrison Ford. So he's couldn't imagine anyone else and he's a childhood hero of mine, so this particular character especially. And uh I have to disagree, though. I think Random Hearts was a movie that Harrison was in that I didn't like, but everything else I've always liked. I have never seen that. Yeah. <laughs> it's on the Voodoo account, Laura. You should watch it. It's not a great movie. I think he's good in it. That's, I think he does a very good dramatic turn in that film, but it's not a very pleasant film to watch. No, it's not. Um, I think he was pretty good in Random um regarding Henry, which was yes. another really solid dramatic role, but Random Hearts never connected with me. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you. It's not one that I go back and re- I think I've seen it two or three times and I probably wouldn't revisit it again, even though I know I own it on my shelf someplace. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and you're going to give me grief, uh, a childhood favorite of yours as well, Shane. I mean, uh, I mean, <laughs> that, well, the combination of Rick Deckard, Han Solo and uh, Indiana Jones. I mean, yeah. And I loved Mosquito Coast as well. Another oh, one. So yeah, I love, yeah, the list is long. I love Mosquito Coast. That's an under underappreciated acting performance. And and I know, having known what Laurie's films still left to go, that we'll be visiting at least one more Harrison Ford film, and not involved with those characters that she's going to put on her list. She's saying is in her top one hundred. So. Uh, we'll get to that at some point in time. No, uh, you know, I've, I'm long on record and Sh- Shane gives me uh, grief every time I talk about Harrison Ford is that he's my all time favorite actor and a large part because of my childhood of growing up with Han Solo and Indiana Jones that I love those roles so much when I was a kid that he was the actor I gravitated towards that he could do, you know, a serial commercial and I would watch it. Uh, I, you know, I'm just, I've always liked his performances and I, and I will honestly admit he's not the greatest actor of all time as far as dramatic skills, but I think he's underappreciated. I think he has some skills. He's, you know, he's not going to go out there and do a, a Daniel Day Lewis and envelop himself in the role, but he, he knows what works for him. He knows what kind of roles he can play. And I do like seeing him challenge himself and, in, in things such as, you know, Witness, which we reviewed a while ago, one of Bobby's all-time favorite picks. You know, Blade Runner, uh, The Mosquito Coast, which, which we haven't reviewed, wouldn't be in my top 100, but it's a distinctly different acting performance. Uh, you know, he is very much, in my mind, and probably always will be, Indiana Jones. And the I would say, even though I love Han Solo, this is the, the role that I think uh, will def- who, what he will forever be tied to. And I think it will be be very, very difficult to find someone to fill those uh, shoes if and when they decide to recast the role. And I, I have no doubt Disney will at some point in time. But at least at this point, this being released in January of 2022 with a, Indi- a fifth Indiana Jones films at least scheduled to be released later this year, um, Disney doesn't seem to be rushing to, to find a different actor to play it at this point. But. Uh, as Bobby brought up, there's another actor in this film, another well-known actor, Sean Connery, playing Henry Jones Sr. Lori, what do you think of Sean Connery in it? He is another one of my all-time favorites. Wow, just there, they had a real father-son chemistry. Even though their relationship was strained, it was so believable. And um, I think Sean Connery was the perfect choice for that role. And again, I can't even picture anybody else in that role. And and Sean Connery is also just perfection in, in everything that he does. Yeah, I can't imagine anyone else playing uh, Henry Jones Sr. Uh, I like Sean Connery, again, always have one of those actors I grew up watching different movies he appeared in. And yeah, I, I think their chemistry 
is what is a big bonus of this movie. I've got reservations about other stuff in it, but their chemistry is terrific. And, um, yeah, I think when they're on screen together, you can tell that their connection is there. I think had they have chosen any lesser actor, I don't think it would have had the the resonance that this film did with the two leads. I think Sean Connery is absolutely perfection as the father as well. As much as Harrison Ford is is Indiana Jones, Sean Connery is Henry. And what I loved about it, there are a lot, there have been times in the past where they've tried to give Sean Connery a different accent, like an American accent or something just to – or even a Russian accent in Hunt for Red October. He's Scottish, and what I liked about it is you've got Indiana Jones could be Scottish, and uh, so the fact that you've got somebody that – could be a first generation immigrant uh, into the United States or, or, or just visiting for all we know. But I, I just thought the fact that he and Harrison got along or Indiana, Indiana got along so well in every scene they were together, it, it felt like a real father and son's scenario in everything that they did. They were so compatible with one another acting wise that I don't think they could have, if they would have put anybody else in there, I think it would have lessened the movie overall. He's that strong of a character. No, I absolutely agree with you with that is that Indiana Jones is even in 1989, this was a very iconic character and the joke with uh, Spielberg was the, you know, the, Indiana Jones came about because he wanted to direct a James Bond film and George Lucas said, no, I've got an idea for a different character. We can we can kind of create our own thing. And that's where Indiana Jones came from. So he jokes, you know, James Bond is the, you know, the father to Indiana Jones. And in this case, literally is because of Sean Connery's performance as Bond and that even though Sean Connery usually plays a much more for lack of a better term, virile male, you know, more of the alpha male, almost Indiana Jones like he plays, a, you know, a very kind of bookwormish character in this. And but he's still the equal uh, of Indiana Jones. And if you had cast a lesser known actor, I don't know how well the chemistry would have been or how, how well the chemistry would have worked in the film. And I think the chemistry in this film is the strength of it is that the, these two characters absolutely work so well together I, you know i now in hindsight and learning that they had opportunities to work together again in other films such in, as in hunt for red october uh such as in jurassic park and the fourth indiana jones films it's really disappointing that they never returned and worked together again in another project that would have been i, I think it would have been really great to have seen them come back and just you know play with each other for a little bit as you know as actors but what about uh, Allison? I don't know if it's Duty or Dottie playing Elsa in the film. Shane, what did you think of Allison as Elsa? Uh, it's Duty, and <laughs> I'm a fan. I remember her in a pretty good Mickey Rourke movie, A Prayer for the Dying, and I just thought she was pretty good. I mean, I didn't really like Kate Capshaw in the previous movie, so that was a step up. A lot of people disagree with me, but I think... She has a different, few different mood swings and character swings in this, which I thought worked. She's a pretty good actress in my eyes, I thought. It wasn't just a damsel in distress. And uh, she looks like Rose Byrne, who's an Australian actress. The more I looked at her re-watching this, she reminded me of Rose Byrne. Well, I will agree totally with what Shane just said about her versus Kate Capshaw. She's definitely a step up from that. But Kate Capshaw was, was, the, <laughs> was not very good in... Uh, the Temple of Doom. So I, I thought Allison Duty was sufficient, and that's about all. To be honest, I think they could have grabbed any Aryan looking blonde with blue eyes girl to play that role in Hollywood, and it wouldn't have been a a big difference. Uh, she she was a plot device, and that was all. She wasn't really required to do a whole lot. And I'm not knocking her as an actress. She did her role just fine. But I, I actually did feel she was more damsel in distress like. She had a, a you know she had a few moments where she stepped out and was trying to do things on her own. But for the most part, she was 
she was along for the ride uh, for the for the Jones boys. And then at the end, she had to be the not so bad baddie when they finally come across the grail itself. So there uh, she had some redeeming qualities. But to be honest, it, it could have been one of many, many actresses of the day. Well, I'm going to disagree with Bobby. I think that her character and and she as an actress brought a lot to the role. She's very beautiful, and I I hadn't seen this in a while, and I didn't remember a lot of stuff about it, and I couldn't remember which side she was on. (laughs) And so I thought that was played really well, that it was kind of ambiguous. I kept going back and forth. Wait, is she... Um, so I thought that was good. And I'm surprised that I'm not familiar with a lot more of her work because I thought she was really talented. I'm, I'm surprised that that I haven't seen more things that she's in. You, you know, I, I, I'm going to agree with Lori that I, I think, you know, to be honest with you, as, as far as looks, I think she's the, the most attractive of all the lead, female leads in all the Indiana Jones films. Um uh, I will without act, question. Yeah. <laughs> and she was a Bond girl. And she was she was Jenny Flex. Jenny Flex from A View to a Kill. Uh, she was 18 when she did the Bond film. She was 21 when she did this film. I mean, I, I would have thought wow. she was much older than that. Uh, not because that she looks older, but she just carries herself with much more maturity uh, in it, which made me feel very sad. When I realized when they were comparing her age to Harrison Ford, who was 46 at the time, which is three years younger than I am at this point. So now I'm feeling really old. So because I always think of this as a very recent film. And he he seems so much older now going back to for Indiana Jones five. That makes me depressed. But back to Alice. But she also she seduced Sean Connery, too. That's true. Don't discount that portion. Correct. But that was done off screen. So I didn't, it doesn't, True. doesn't reflect. And once again, as Shane has pointed out, that was funny. I, I fixate on Harrison <laughs> Ford more than Sean Connery, but, but I think she did a really, really g- good job in the role because she was the intellectual equivalent of Indiana Jones compared to Kate Cap. And, and I'll agree with Shane and Bobby. Kate Capshaw was horrible. Uh, that's my least favorite. All, all the uh, Indiana, Indy, Indiana Jones female leads is that she's she's nothing but a damsel in distress. I I I don't consider Elsa a damsel in distress. She's part of part of it. I mean, she's she's the you know kind of the reflection of the the transition of Henry Jones Senior. Her his obsession passes kind of to her by the end of the film that she is so obsessed with it. Uh, you know the 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 Grail that she loses sight of everything that's important. And uh, I I like that kind of uh, kind of dramatic turn for her character. But she's not just the, you know, the the kind of the rambunctious fighter that Karen Allen was in the first and fourth one. And she's not just a screaming maniac like Kate Capshaw was in the second one, which drove me up the wall. I really like this this kind of characterization that they have for uh, someone to share the adventure with. And she's never quite full villain, but she's never quite full hero either. And I like that duality of her character character. But Bob- can I just say um, that I agree she's not a screaming maniac and she could have been. I mean, that rat scene, she could have gone berserk like Kate Capshaw did with the bugs, but it was leveled a lot more. Yeah, I agree with Shane on that one. That was I think that was the biggest issue with Kate Capshaw was the fact that every scene that she was in, it wasn't just that she was a damsel in distress. It was that she was a crazy damsel in distress yeah and this one here i agree allison is better at playing somebody who's a little more measured in her responses and does have an intellect superior to the show girl that was kate capshaw all right well matt's not here tonight so while i try to think of something from matt's moral universe bobby why don't you tell us about some symbolism and hidden meanings (laughs) Well, can I throw out one more casting person just before we go to that that we can all talk about is River Phoenix as young Indiana Jones. Okay. Because I thought he was absolute perfection as that character. And I think the fact that they cast him was such a stroke of genius because, first of all, he and Harrison Ford were on Mosquito Coast together not, what, a year, two years before this? So it was very – very recent. But what I had read was that 
um, River, because he had been with Harrison for so long on the set of Mosquito Coast, he knew his mannerisms. So he mimicked him as young Indiana Jones naturally. So it became more of an organic transition from the young Indiana Jones to the older man, and I believed it. And I think the fact that they had this adventurous young wonderful wonderful actor playing the character of indiana i just i think had they have chosen had they have had a normal kid actor any other kid actor it probably you know put will wheaton in the role at the same time and i think you would have it indiana wouldn't have been as strong but river was awesome i just loved him well, I like Will Wheaton, so don't go, <laughs> don't go staring. Oh, I, I like him too, but he, but but to have the the kid from Star Trek playing mm-hmm. Indiana Jones is not the same thing as having uh, the kid from um, Stand by Me, the that's the strong silent type. I love River Phoenix. He yeah. was he was great, and yeah that that was that was great, and I I think he, like you said, it was the. I can't remember how you said it, but he did. He really did become a young Harrison Ford. I believed that. But don't bash Will Wheaton in the process. Oh. <laughs> I, I love Will. I, sorry. I know. But, I'm just but same era. Okay, <laughs> let me say this. Corey Feldman at, <laughs> would have been a disaster. Well, yeah, I think we could all agree on that without a doubt. <laughs> Shane? Yeah, I wasn't going to um, bring this up to the end, um, but I'm glad Bobby brought up River because I didn't watch this. Like when he passed away in the early 90s, I was so – I grew up watching everything he did. I was only a couple of years – well, a few years younger than him. So, you know, I related to him. Every movie he made I thought was brilliant. And as a young movie fan, he did so many different choices of films, and it really upset me. I remember him, one of the main – people when I was a kid just hearing that he passed away and it was just really upsetting for me and I didn't watch anything he did again for you know over a decade I just and even watching I had not seen uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade for 20 years I haven't revisited this movie in full for at least 20 years Um, I know it was released in 89 so I'd seen it a couple of times since but when he passed away I have not watched anything Um, I just couldn't bring myself to it Mm. so He's brilliant in this and perfect, and I think uh, he is the young Indiana Jones, not uh, mm-hmm. Sean Patrick Flannery, wasn't it, on the television show? Yeah, well, he's one of the Can people. you imagine the career he would have had? Oh, it's really sad, Laurie, because yeah. just going back and watching My Private Idaho and, and mm-hmm. Mosquito Coast and I Love You to Death and just it goes on. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really sad, and I'm all right yeah. now. But I, <laughs> I just couldn't bring myself to watch anything he did for a long time. You know, um, I think River Phoenix was a very talented actor. I don't like him as Indiana Jones. And that's why I kind of say we're in kind of my viewpoint is going to be hard to replace Indiana Jones. I mean, this was the first of a couple different actors who tried to play him at different ages in life. So, uh, the others following in the young, energy, young, energy, in young Indiana Jones Chronicles or whatever that was uh, that came out a few years later. Uh, you know, other than it setting up the cro- uh, the cross of Coronado, I didn't really like. Th- I, I, that's the weakest part of the film to me. I don't really like the first ten or fifteen minutes of the film. I don't enjoy it as much, and it's not because I didn't like River Phoenix. I just didn't like. I, I didn't find it interesting. I didn't think it was totally essential to driving the story forward of where this was ultimately going to go. Other than it was going a long way to explain every element of how Indiana Jones became Indiana Jones. And that's one of the things I dislike about this film is that, yeah, I don't need to know how he got a scar, his hat, why he's fear snakes, um, all all that stuff. It just seemed too, too much in too short a period of time. So yeah, I I don't have a problem with Indiana or with river Phoenix. I just didn't really like his characterization of uh, Indiana Jones, but, to be fair, I didn't like anybody else's characterizations of Indiana Jones. So it's Harrison Ford and Harrison Ford, Ford only, at least at this point in time. All right, Bobby, what about symbolism and hidden meanings? I've only got a few on here. There are this movie's full of them. And so, to be honest, I undercut it on purpose because people can find symbolism all over that movie. But the ones that I came up with are the mountain set in the opening sequence with River Phoenix, where he's running around in the desert there's uh one of those opening or there's a big opening 
cavernous area that sim- it's a, it's supposed to symbolize the Paramount Pictures logo. So that was an interesting uh, tidbit that I had discovered about it. Uh, I do have that in the sequence where Henry scares the seagulls into the sky to take down the Nazi fighter that's trying to kill him. It symbolized Henry's old school ingenuity and fearlessness to overcome the next generation's technological superiority and arrogance. I have the faith journey taken by Indy toward the grail was the same journey taken by the knight who protects protects the grail both men symbolize purity of purpose and faithfulness to the cause while the nazis who followed indy to the grail room cheated their way in thus causing their downfall in the end while indy and the and the knight survived and then i have hitler's signature in the grail diary symbolizes the closest the fuhrer got to physically touching a relic from the bible in the first movie, the Ark never made it out of Africa, and in this movie, the diary with Hitler's signature was in the same Grail room when the Grail was lost again. And that's it. Yeah, and that's well done, Bobby. <laughs> I'm hopeless with symbolism. <laughs> the only thing I probably noticed that I could add is when uh, they first go into that um, big castle and then they knock the buck- butler out and then they go into that room and look down and all the Nazis are there running around and in the control room it's the rats just like what we've just seen oh they good point symbolize yeah symbolize the rats being nazis and terrible people oh that was good i didn't think about the rat being not um yeah that was good good job bobby <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I really like the uh, the element of uh, Henry Jones Sr., his old ways as compared to the new ways of Indy flying planes, driving the cars, the gun being empty when he absolutely needed it at that point in time and not having the ingenuity to think of a, a weapon of a different uh, vein. And in this case, almost a religious vein, since he's r- r- remembering uh, literature to to uh, to overcome the the plane coming down to essentially blow them away at that point. I like that. All right. Well, I will try Matt's moral universe and you guys can help me out on this one that, you know, the, the morality of this is that Indy is going to find his father. That is his mission at the get go. But as a, as a matter of course, as he's going to find his father, he keeps becoming progressively entwined with the search for the Holy grail until at the end of the film, he actually, goes and search searches it on the own on his own to stop the nazis the idea of once he has marcus and once he has his father and sala right after the tank goes over the edge he can give up they're safe they, they can ride off into the sunset and be safe but they 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 approach and go into danger again and the biggest element of why he does this is because his father is saying you know it's a, it's a race against evil Although it's to me, it's like I don't really know what the Nazis could have done with this other than to bring Hitler there, (laughs) uh, if you will, because they it has such a limited scope of power of where it could go. Although that's unknown until we meet the the night. What do you think of this kind of this the abandonment of his original task is just merely saving his father, which is more uh, what I would say is more noble uh, than the idea of actually getting the grail first. I feel like that was so important to his father that it was connected and it didn't strike me as odd. I feel like that's what Henry Jones would have wanted him to do. But that's that's the thing that's drove in the wedge between the two of them, his, his father's obsession with the Grail research. And yet at the end of the film, he's he's basically supporting that obsession and the, you know, that that's what I find kind of a, a twist on it. He seems to be so against this quest for the grail throughout the entirety of the film or the, his father's obsession with it, that he, you know, that he gets angry and that's why they haven't spoken for a long time because they just didn't have that connection. But when he saw it was attainable and he could help fulfill his father's dreams and, you know, quest lifelong quest, I feel like, because of his love for his father, he wanted to help him complete that. Do you think that was for Henry or I for think, mankind? I can't help but think a lot of it was for his father. His father put that, you know, that was his father's passion. But I also think he's a very noble character. I can't add too much other than they're from the same bloodline. 
And although they both do their th- do their ways very differently at times, uh, and they probably have never worked together before, I think there's a bit of compensation there for for um, Indiana Jones to be on his dad's side and help his dad fulfill that dream. I think you guys are all right. I think everybody I, – I think the characters – he is a noble character. He is doing this to aid his father once he gets closer to the grail because, Patrick, you said that they were already safe. Why did they continue the quest is because his father was obsessed with it, which did drive the wedge between them. But if you think about – Indy in all three and actually all four movies that we've seen of him, he's obsessive compulsive himself. As soon as he gets locked in on something, he doesn't let go until he obtains it at all costs, including near-death experiences for himself and everybody in his party. So the fact that he locks in on the grail and then immediately instead of going, okay, everybody's safe, end of movie, we're, we're good, don't worry about that Hitler is going to end up with the Holy Grail to live forever. It, that's his character would never do that. His character is going to immediately turn back to to save mankind and go. That isn't going to happen on my watch if I'm this close. I mean that that's that was the whole setup in the very beginning of the movie. Is Indy Junior? Sorry, Indy Young Indy goes after the Cross of Coronado specifically, or when he gets it, it has to go to a museum. It's not to be sold to the highest bidder. Or, or for personal gain like Hitler wanted, this is for mankind. It needs to be in a museum just like all of Indy's stuff ends up in a museum. So I think that's the moral high ground that he takes here. I would say that there is moral ambiguity as far as Elsa and the Jones boys and ultimately I think even didn't – didn't Marcus end up with her as well? I, I don't remember, uh, but it just seemed like she just kind of used her feminine wiles to get her way whenever possible with the archaeologists, and and it it moved her character along in that path. When we're dealing with righteous men in a lot of ways, the the bodyguards of the Grail as well as the knight himself. So I thought that was an interesting choice as well. Well, uh, let me you know throw one last wrinkle into this to see if it changes anybody's mind. Indy goes, uh, is presumably goes over the cliff with the tank. Henry Jones Sr. seems to have this moment of reflection of what he's lost. He's lost his son and he ha- has not had the ability to make amends and to explain you know, his love and his affection for his son uh, because he's always been busy with other things, primarily his quest for the gold grail then andy pops up and it's played for humor but you have this very poignant moment where he hugs his son and says i thought i lost you but then immediately turns around and says let's go you know like it, it, do you, you know do, do you find that the awkwardness of that especially in light of the fact in the, the closing sequences of the film you know where he tells indy to let it go he wasn't willing to let it go at that point in time and neither one of them ends up with the grail the Grail stays there in that in that temple, presumably to possibly be found by somebody else someday. You know, so that was something that always kind of bothers me is that, you know, if you if he really if you really understood what you almost lost at that moment, why would you risk it again to 30 seconds later? You know, um, that didn't bother me. I thought that I love that scene. I love the you know the the humor in that and i just think that's that's the jones voice <laughs> they oh you're okay okay let's go and then but when it really counted he chose his son first did he did, did i mean i mean i i understand he tells his son to let it go but he could have let it go himself at that point he was not willing to let i mean and he thought he lost his son he thought he that indy had died you know, it wasn't like a possibility. He thought he was dead and that it, the, this time to make amends is, it had passed him by and he did not take advantage of it. But then he puts it all at risk again a few a seconds later. But don't we look at in the, his character overall, all of these adventures, whether on screen in the three movies that we watch up to this point, 
and all of the adventures that he talks about in his classroom in front of those starstruck students, he is constantly putting his life in danger of his own accord without his father's guidance and without his father's presence. And all of a sudden, now they're brought together by a collision of Nazis going after the one obsession that that his father has. And all of a sudden, oh, I lost Junior. Uh, you know, poor, poor me. You know, or poor Junior. Uh, all of a sudden, all the fatherly love comes out. Now, I'm not saying it was a great scene, and it's, it's wonderfully done. But I'm just saying that the fact that he's immediately turned right back to the grail is completely within his character. His son is okay. He's always been okay. He's he's survived a, a near death experience like he always has in the past. Let's roll. We're we're you know the grails around the corner. Let's head off. So I think that's completely within both characters in how they deal with things. Shane, you got anything on that? Uh, not really. I agree that um, one of the few things that I remember from 20 years ago when I last saw this in full was the tank going over the cliff and uh, Indy presumed passed away, but uh, not. And then the switch in mood from Sean Connery's character. I just always remember that. and it was, It's a great moment and just beautiful acting. But, um, yeah, I can't add anything else. So I think that scene is just before that happened, um, Elsa died because she was trying to grab the, the chalice. And if we sort of as an audience member probably thought, well, if Indy's going to grab it, he might do the same thing and perish. And that's why he decided not to. And go with his dad. All right, Shane. What about the music in this film? Once again, uh, scored by uh, our maestro, our favorite composer, at least mine and Laurie's favorite composer, John Williams. What did you think of this the soundtrack? Well, a little bit like Laurie said about Harrison Ford playing Indiana Jones. It, it's Harrison Ford, and in this case, it's John Williams. <laughs> so it's an unmistakable score from John Williams. Um, it's always brilliant. All four movies actually so all i can say is just it seemed like there was unlimited music cues throughout meaning not one scene had silence there was always some kind of music playing in the background and um not a lot of the raiders march so i only heard it i think twice which was on the train scene at the start and then obviously riding off into the sunset at the end so everything in between was just different except that little Raiders of the Lost Ark thing when he saw the pattern of the Ark on the wall but loved it loved the soundtrack I own a copy of it always have uh, really enjoyed the Indiana Jones music scores I agree with what you guys talk about John Williams is what Harrison Ford is to the Indiana Jones well he's Steven he's what Steven Spielberg is to this the Indiana Jones sequences I mean he's he's incredible and I think that it's unfair for us to say anything but the the highest praise for pretty much one of the greatest composers of all time. And for these – for him basically to do all of Steven Spielberg's movies the way he has, and every one of them seems to be unique in its own way. Yes, they'll play a few of the same – the same riffs that they played in the the original because that's what you remember. It's the same reason that we hear Rocky's theme in all of the Rocky mu- movies. It's it's of iconic. Course, yeah. yeah, it's iconic, and that's what you. Re- and if you didn't, if they didn't have him playing that, you go, "What's wrong with this picture? Who's the who's the composer now?" Because it's not John Williams because he would do it right. And in this case, John Williams is just he's flawless, and this. The soundtrack for this is flawless, and I think had they have chosen anything else, I think they would have completely missed the mark. And and like Shane said, this, he does not just one, two, and three. He does four also, and as much as four drops off the face of the earth quality-wise, just like number two isn't nearly up to the quality of one and three, his music in all four movies is phenomenal. He never dropped the mark in all four movies, so highest marks – possible from from me crystal skull's score is if you haven't heard it in a while and you might not have if you haven't seen the film it's right on par with raiders of lost ark it's really good he's john williams he's one of the greatest soundtrack composers if not the greatest of all time that's all i've got to say 
well, no, I'll say he's the greatest soundtrack composer or film composer of all time, that he has so many memorable scores, so many uh, memorable films that he was involved with. You know, I, I love the score. And I had Raiders, I had the Raiders of the Lost Ark soundtrack in 1981 on LP. I still do, actually. But, uh, you know, and they went along with my, uh, you know, soundtrack album for Star Wars and Empire. And I didn't, you know, I never collected another one until this film came out. And I, I, and I bought this soundtrack because I love that. Uh, the music in this film so much and that was it was the beginning of my obsession with more uh soundtracks i bought them on a much more regular basis after that you know a couple a year uh depending on whether i like the film and i you know i still listen to it to this day i still love this soundtrack a lot i think it has a lot of really great moments in it i agree with shane that i i don't think there's a weak moment in any point in the indiana jones series as far as uh musical composition sometimes story-wise but not musical composition John Williams has always done an outstanding job composing the music for these uh, four films, soon to be five films, because he is doing the, the score for the fifth film as well. All right, let's talk about the ending of the film. We already kind of hinted at it of Elsa dropping or, or trying to get the uh, the grail while hanging precariously uh, over a, a chasm, Indy trying to hang on to her, and then she falls, and then Indy being held by his father, then reaching for it, and Henry telling him to let it, let it go, showing this symbolic transition of his character that he finally understands what's truly important, and Indy lets it go and returns to his father where they go to safety. But then they ride off in the sunset. I want to know what you guys think of that, that ending, and and... Do you think the series should have ended with this film? Uh, not having seen Indiana Jones 5 or whatever it is, by the time this comes out, we might have an actual title. But do you think that it should have just been three and done for this series? I don't. Was the Crystal Skull my favorite? No. But it was still a good movie. And it was Indiana Jones. And I'm so excited for this fifth one. So I don't think it should have ended. I'm I'm excited for the next one. What about the ending in this one? I liked it. I liked the way that th that father and son had their moments, and and um, I was very satisfied with the ending. Uh, look, I didn't like the ending much. Um, it was okay. I mean, the riding off into the sunset to the theme was great, but uh, how they got there and how it all ended up. Um, I've got a lot of negativity about certain parts of this movie, which I haven't touched on yet, but I will. Hopefully I'm allowed to. Uh, I didn't nope, you're done. The, you're the, done. The we're whole, no, we're not going to let you talk I won't anymore. do it immediately. Don't worry. I'll do it in my final sign off. But uh, the night, was he a ghost? Did he take the chalice and was he living forever? Who was he? He lifted up the sword and nearly fell over. And then he was going to pass it to Indiana Jones, who didn't accept it. And, yeah, I just didn't like the ending at all and the, the Nazis running in and, yeah, it, it, you know, it didn't ruin the movie or anything, but if you're just asking me about the ending, I didn't like it. At the time, I thought that it was the perfect ending for the Jones trilogy, and I think had they have stayed there, I think it would have been perfect. Uh, in my opinion, you know, two notwithstanding two being substandard, the other two are pillars that you can build on. It's a lot. It, it's similar to the Back to the Future trilogy, which was awesome first, second was uh, so so, you know, and then you've got number three that just knocked it out of the park again. And I think that's the same thing that I've got here. Is I think that. Had in 1989, when I saw this in the theater and people walked out of the theater satisfied, they could have ended it. And I, and honestly, they should have ended it. I don't think that they need to continue on with a character just because Hollywood wants the money. And just because Harrison Ford is of age and they're writing him, you know, to, to be a superhero that, that he is. It's still – it feels cheap to me at this point. It, it's a lot like the Rocky series. You know, They could have ended it at two and been just fine. Go to three, all right, I get it. Four, eh, five is ridiculous and beyond. And that's kind of what they're doing here is they're beating the dead horse until they're just going to replace – Indiana Jones with some nobody actor from today that will it will kill the entire series. So 
I believe that that it, it could have and should have ended at the end of three. I will also agree, though, that in this viewing, I'm agreeing completely with what Shane is talking about. I don't like how the how this film ended. There were too many uh, too many loose ends. It was a such a quality movie all the way through to that very end and all of a sudden they just started throwing stuff at you the night what happened to him you know what was his intention he's been there for millennia (laughs) and he's still you know and he's trying to get indy to do the the, this thing indy and and elsa falling into or potentially falling into the chasm was so fast 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 uh the fact that all of a sudden, the Jones or uh, Henry, who's been so great through the whole film, is reduced to the damsel in distress waiting for Indy to bring the, the, the grail along to save his dad's life and then right off into the sunset. I mean he was so great until then, and I just – there are some parts that I just find that it, it wasn't as quality this time as I remember in 1989 when it really should have ended. You know, and it's weird, you and Shane take that position. I think this is the best ending of the four Indiana Jones films. And I love Raiders of the Lost Ark, and I consider that a near-perfect film. But I don't, you know, I think it, it gets wrapped up so neatly with, and all the Nazis are wiped out by the ghosts. And there's a lot of loose ends with that. Like, how the hell do they get off the island? <laughs> you know, what, you know, the, aren't there a whole bunch of other Nazis still over by the sub, you know, the subs and things like that, that there's a lot of unanswered questions, you know, as, as much as the, this film, the MacGuffin, in this film is the Holy grail. The relationship between uh, Indy and his father is what the film is about. And you finally have this meeting of the minds where, his father gives up on the obsession because his son is more important and the son who's headstrong and generally ignores what his father wants finally listens. And it's very, very symbolic that they give up on the quest at that point in time. Now, obviously I've already articulated that maybe they should have earlier, but I think it is done very, very well, you know, at that point in the film, I, I agree with you. There are some plot threads like hey you know all the all the little uh arab men ran out of the temple (laughs) he dropped their guns and ran out and and they they disarmed all the nazi soldiers but when the temple started to collapse everybody started evacuating what happened to all of them you know that where did they go you know they all know where the the temple is so i mean there's some unanswered questions i think but at the end of the it's day it's supernatural yeah you know, at the end of the day i just i gloss over it because as i said the holy grail is the MacGuffin. it's not what the point of the film is about it's about the relationship between those two characters is that's truly what the film is the essential core of what this film is about and that's what i love about it is the evolution of those two characters to that point where they finally connect much, much later in life than most people do with, the, with between father and son. I love the I love biblical archaeology, and I just love the the what if and you know just I love that whole plot line and that whole story, and I loved that about Raiders of the Lost Ark. So I I love the way it ends, and I and I I remember th- that part. I remember vividly that plot about the about the chalice and being the humble ser- Jesus being the humble servant. And I just love that. All right. Well, uh, let's talk about the film's legacy nominated for three Academy Awards, winning one, one uh, best effects, sound effects, editing lost best sound to glory and lost best music, original score. John Williams lost to Alan Menken for the little mermaid. Uh, was on AFI, was nominated for uh, AFI's 2001 list of the 400 400 movies uh, being considered for the top 100 thrills list. It ultimately did not make the top 100. It is currently number 124 on IMDb's top 250 films list. Um, The film inspired Lucas to create the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles, which Harrison Ford actually appeared in one episode. The film itself is the third in the series, which was followed by Indiana Jones and Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, which we've referred to multiple times, and the currently filming Indiana Jones 5. 
uh, grossed over 197 million in the United States and over 474 million worldwide. Was the second highest grossing film of 1989 behind Batman in the United States and was the highest grossing film of 1989 on a worldwide basis. It is the second highest grossing film of the Indiana Jones franchise behind Crystal Skull. And Rotten Tomatoes has it at 88% critics and 94% audience. So all that being said, what do you think of the legacy and would you put it in your top 100? Bobby. I think that the legacy is actually quite accurate. The fact that it lost to the little mermaid for original score doesn't surprise me, but it definitely deserved the Oscar nomination for that. The fact that it lost to glory. Eh, I, I, it's all right. Glory. I think glory had a lot of, it was sound heavy. So that's probably why it, it lost. Uh, but otherwise it's, it's, lovingly remembered the way it should be and as far as the movie is concerned as much as i just uh, i agree with shane that there are weak points on the ending from a plot standpoint in a story i still love this movie i think this is a fantastic movie ending included i'm just saying that there are points that could have been tied up a little neater than what they did that's all because this is a fantastic movie the casting is is awesome You've got actors at the top of their game uh, at the right ages. You've got a, a, a trilogy that, again, should have ended here, and it would have been near perfect in how it – at least the bookend portion of it. So this is a special movie, and as far as my top 100, I I have to agree with what IMDb said about their top 250. This is number 124 on their list, and I'd have to say the same thing because – Raiders of the Lost Ark is in my top 100. This one would narrowly not make it just because it's hard for me to put two of the same series into my top 100. But otherwise, this is a fantastic movie worth watching any time. Lori? Oh, do I have room? No, you don't. But you need you have to make a decision film by film. Did I put did we do did I put Raiders of the Lost? Ugh, I can't. Uh, I Raiders of the Lost Ark. Will, yes, you did. Gosh. Oh man, I'm gonna put it in there for now. <laughs> okay. I love this film. And Lori's now picked her 106, 102nd <laughs> film of her top 100 list. So, getting close to that. <laughs> so many good movies. <laughs> Such a short list. Eventually, you have to pare it down. <laughs> yes. Shane. Well, no, it's not going to be in my 100. And re-watching it after so long, I didn't like it much overall as a kid. And watching it again now, the comedy aspects to it was, to me, too distracting. It didn't make me enjoy it at all at times. Overall, I did, but I, I got frustrated at the little – it might as well have been called Monty Python and the Holy Grail at times because there was these – odd little pairings of uh, things happening that were supposed to be funny. And that, to me, they just weren't with the, the car getting stuck on the front of the tank and the, the pair of them tied up going around and around in circles in a fireplace. Uh, there's a airborne dogfight scene. And I'm not talking just about the uh, special effects because obviously it's 1989. That was a rear projection screen by the look of it, but it looked, reminded me of Spielberg's 1941 with the, and then they were in the, the Hindenburg and or what not the Hindenburg but the airship <laughs> that just throwing the Nazi out the window you know I know it's it's all part of the the fun and the, and the fantasy of the, the Indiana Jones tale but I didn't like it like it really started to annoy me and it, it's admirable that they were trying to capture the magic of Raiders after Temple of Doom sort of took it way off beat. But it, I just I, I can't put it in my top 100 as much as I love the Indiana Jones character. Unfortunately, it just wasn't funny that the the reference of Sean Connery also slept with Elsa. Not funny to me. The <laughs> the villain isn't good. Julian Glover, not he's a weak villain. Agreed. You know, he's a really strong Agreed. villain. Agreed. Yeah. Uh, Denholm Elliott was even. I know he was a lot older than he was in Raiders Lost Ark, but even he was bumbling in certain moments of this. And to me, it just didn't didn't pan out for me as, as much as I hoped it would. 
Uh, so definitely not in my top 100. The legacy, of course, is worthy because it is got state of the art sound and effects and and that. And it doesn't surprise me it didn't win, but Spielberg had a lot of bad luck there for a long time. So I'm not surprised. Uh, it is a great film, but I have tons of reservations about it. Nothing to me will be as good as Raiders of the Lost Ark. Crystal Skull was okay to watch. I wish they had stopped at three because now they're making this fifth one. And um, I don't know, unless they do it right, I don't like these reboots. I really don't. <laughs> All right. Well, um, obviously it's in my top 100 you know, much like Bobby talks about how some films are more of, you know, they obviously not what you would consider a traditional cinema top 100 film. This is a very sentimental top 100 film of mine. I, this, this film was one of the first films that came out when I worked in a movie theater. I remember going to an advanced, it it came out, I believe on a Wednesday. Uh, we got an advanced screening on a Monday night, uh, for it. Uh, and I, I, I was a, uh, a, a junior in high school at that point, and I begged my parents to say, "Hey, can I just sneak off to a twelve thirty in the in the night showing, uh, so I can see this movie so desperately because I want to see it." And surprisingly enough, because that, that was the last week of school, my parents let me go, and I was exhausted the next day. But I had such a great time watching it. You know, it was. I enjoyed the film and the themes of the film. You know, I was seventeen at the time, as most seventeen year old uh, kids do. They don't necessarily get along with their parents. I didn't necessarily get along with my father, but I took my father to see it a few weeks later uh, for Father's Day, and he really enjoyed the film, and it was something that we bonded over. So that's one of the the biggest sentimental uh, reasons why I still love this film to this day. Uh, It's a film uh, just a few weeks ago, um, and we were recording this obviously over the summer, I watched it with my kids for Father's Day. I, you know, I got to pick the movie for Father's Day, and this is the one I decided to pick, mainly because we were going to be reviewing it, but it's also kind of a Father's Day film. And my kids have seen it multiple times, and they love it. And all the jokes that Shane says that don't play very well play very well for them. And I take joy in watching them take joy in the, something that I really, really love as, as much as this. I, I will shock you all right now and say, This is in my top 10 of all time favorite films because it is just an enjoyable ride. And I have seen this film. I kid you not. I've probably seen this film probably 70 or 80 times. I just love this movie to death. And I'm not shocked. Uh, and the ending of it, because I worked in the movie theater (laughs) and it was the one that went the longest when I was closing down the movie theater, it always would go to 1230 when I was the, I was the last usher to leave. So from 12 to 1230, everything would be done. We'd just be waiting for this movie to finish. I watched the half hour, probably hundreds of times, you know, just like it just so many, so many times I watched the ending of this film. So, and it still plays well for me. I really, really love this film. Uh, it will always be one of my all time favorites. First movie poster I ever framed, uh, was the advanced poster for this film. It, it just meant that much, uh, much, that much to me. And, uh, and as I said, it's a, it's more of a sentimental pick. I cannot sit here and say it, it, it equals Raiders of the Lost Ark, but both of those films are in my top 10 and, and I, I hemmed and hawed too. Like Bobby said, could I put both of those two films from the same film series in my top 100 and at the end of the day, much like Bobby saying, Hey, Roxanne is his all time favorite film. I, I, I'm very, I feel prime, but probably pretty close to that. I'm not saying that's my all time favorite film, but it's up there. It's, you know, possibly top six, uh, uh, Raiders is still higher, but this is this is definitively up there. For many years, I said it was my all time favorite film, but after watching Raiders more times, I went, yeah, that's that's a better film. So I'll give it credit. But that definitely, it's definitely in my top one hundred. All right, well, that does it for this month's review of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Thanks again for joining us and listening to our little monthly podcast. If you've had a good time, the fun doesn't have to stop here. Uh, you can follow us on pinterest or twitter at mh memories on either one of those social media outlets you can keep yourself informed about our occasional written film reviews and film summaries news on upcoming theatrical releases and trailers and information on many upcoming podcasts on the mhn podcast network additionally don't forget to subscribe to our account on youtube where we're now releasing our podcasts exclusively 
Once you subscribe to our account, you can get updates on when we post new materials. And you can also give us a thumbs up or thumbs down as to our podcast and leave a comment about the film we reviewed, our opinions about that film, or even suggestions of what you think we should put into our top 100 films of all time course we always like the reviews that are positive but we appreciate any feedback that we can get from any listeners of the show well that does it for this episode of movie house memories join us next time when it's bobby's next pick for one of the greatest films of all time and he's choosing 2004's the passion of the christ until then i'm patrick i'm bobby i'm Lori. and i'm shane and we'll see you all next time at our house podcast is intended for entertainment and information purposes only the theme music for movie house memories hiding your reality is provided courtesy of kevin mcleod at incompetech.com under a creative commons attribution 3.0 license all original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of the mhn podcast network movie house memories and fuzzy bunny slippers entertainment llc unless otherwise noted